Leonard, thanks a lot for allowing me to share this video that we're going to do today. Um, I'm doing the recording here. That's why I'm kind of kicking it off this way. But uh, but you approached me and asked me uh, some questions. And I thought well, we could share this with a broader audience. If, and, and thanks again for allowing me to do that. But you want to start off with uh, sharing a little bit about your background and what you're interested in talking about? Yeah, thanks, Guy. So, and thanks for agreeing to to chat with me. Um, yeah, my my name for the sake of the recording is Leonard Hauks. I have been working in online learning for I think about fifteen years now, and uh, I trained originally as a librarian to be a university librarian, and my career in university librarianship. Uh, morphed very quickly um, while I, this all happened since I moved to the UK. So I'm American, I'm from Oregon, Portland, Oregon, um, uh, by way of New York and moved to, to London. Um, once I moved to London 15 years ago to follow my wife, uh, the, the library career I thought I was gonna be having turned into an e-learning career. And I haven't looked back. and. Um, but then within that learning technology, e-learning career, um, mostly in universities, but also in the uh, membership sector, FE sector, OPM sector, um, it, it started moving more towards in what I call or would have called instructional design. Um, but it was a very strange journey for me because... Um, because actually in the UK at that time, nobody talked about instructional design. It was like a, a weird secret. And, you know, I, you could go to, I, I mean, I've been to so many conferences, I've been to so many, so many things. And, um, the, the term even instructional design is never mentioned. Um, even basic things like Meyer, you know was never discussed um and and i really um and it has nothing it's kind of weirdly a weird coincidence that i am american because i i didn't know any of these things from being american or that you know because many of these authors are american um uh i i had to kind of find them on my own and i have found other people in the uk who've done the same thing you know autodidacts who you know just read loads of stuff to be better at what they do um and and they are as it happens the best instructional designers i know in the uk they're all they all tend to be really strong autodidacts but um but there was like a kind of a embargo you know that i i seem to perceive and then at the same time a kind of a a move um on the part of um a, a kind of a alliance between the, the open university the institute for education and jisc uh, among other people who would seem to kind of work together to create this kind of new approach that typically fell under the heading of learning design and um most of these people would um, really like. Uh, um, and I'm, it's funny we're recording this because I'm really just talking to you, guy. Just to like be clear, I'm the, the, right, you're the right. person I'm. You're the one I'm talking to right now. And um, the the uh, most of them just would would really if they would either not to talk about instructional design at all this kind of like decades and decades long body of writing would, would either not talk about it at all. So it's just like, we just created this thing called learning design ex nihilo, or they would dismiss it through a kind of a cheap straw man argument. So instructional design is based on pedagogy, but learning design is based on andragogy. That was my favorite. And that was actually Mike Sharples, who's like a very esteemed professor emeritus from the Open University, or a, um, you know, uh, instructional design is about designing materials, but 
learning design is about designing full experiences, you know, or um, et, et cetera, et cetera. Or, or, or instructional design is based on behaviorism, whereas learning design is based on blah, 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 constructivism. Yeah. And, and so, and, and, you know, what's really clear is that no, these people just haven't read any learning or instructional design. They, have, they don't know the first thing. It's, it's really clear because they would be able to see, for example, that um, in the, the little I know of the research, because it's such a huge body of research, I feel quite humbled to even, you know, try to say what it is. But what's clear is that, um, for one thing, in the history of instructional design, it hasn't been even called one thing. Like even within those debates, it's been called instructional systems design. It's been called instructional technology and design. It's been called, you know, all these kind of different permutations. And the definition of what it is has has varied hugely, and has certainly included things like constructivism, or or problem based learning, or 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 you know processes and and materials or you know what what have you uh taxonomies um and and so to to give these sort of uh, facile strongman arguments is um really uh disturbing and and not something that people should should settle for um and uh and so anyway i the reason i wanted to call you is because next week I am going to be doing a presentation at the University of Leeds, and I wanted to talk about this because at the University of Leeds, they're doing really unprecedented, what like a level of investment in learning technology and in pedagogy, really, that I think is unprecedented for a UK research university. Um, it's It's a huge investment. They have over... I think like over 120 people um, in kind of different like learning technology roles. They've got they they manage to attract some not just like really good people in lower and middle positions, but like some real stars in UK higher ed in in leadership positions. Um, and so and Margaret Korosech who who I know invited me to speak and and um not being afraid of uh, spicy topics said like oh you know if you want to talk about you know learning design and instructional design you should talk about that and I was kind of like oh yeah I'm gonna go and like really <laughs> really alienate some people you know <laughs> like when I go and and so um yeah I just I guess I'd love to hear I guess from your perspective, like wh what, what maybe, maybe what you see, like I, some of the things I'd love to hear is like, first, what you think that people risk losing, you know, if they don't um, go back and, and look at these historic insights, like why, and maybe a bit about why you think why, why we have such a bad kind of amnesia or like lack of self-respect or something in in the world of education and um and i guess maybe lastly like what if we could just you know because it's not about the semantics as such it's about people being good at they do being good at what they do and being able to get what they need like what what do they need that's, I guess, my final question. What do they need to actually be good instructional designers or learning designers or whatever you want to call it? Yeah, so that, that's interesting questions. And uh, the, sorry, I just, I just kind of dumped them all at you. I, I should have. <laughs> well, we'll go through them, and you can make sure that I don't miss anything. But the, yeah. the late Joe Harless, back in 1985 at a, at an NSPI conference. Uh, talk about name changes and issues and language issues. Uh, that's an interesting topic also. But uh, he complained and lamented uh, the fact that our language was so poorly used and inconsistent. And he said, uh, the mark of a true profession is consistency of terms and definitions. And we have had none of that. And we still do not have that. Now, um, I started in 1979. I have a radio TV film degree, and I had been working for a company called Wix Lumber 
um, in, in Lawrence, Kansas, where I went to my university, and they were going to convert from 35 millimeter slides with audio tracks to video. And my manager went to a management conference for the company and I had worked for three managers and he was the third manager. And as the HR vice president told me when I interviewed with him, he said, we had this management conference and I, we announced to all the managers that we we're going to be switching over all of our training to video-based training. And I had three managers, your managers, come up and insisted that I hire you. So that's why you're here. They flew me to Saginaw, Michigan from Lawrence, Kansas, three weeks in a row to talk Ooh. to various people and gave me the job. And so my job title um, was program developer in the training services organization. And at that time, and I and I joined a professional society, the NSPI chapter in Detroit, Michigan, 100 miles away. And they were the Michigan Society for Instructional Technology. So the word technology used to mean and still does mean, although it's not used as such, technology means the application of science. So instructional technology is mm -hmm. not about digital tools, computer tools to help with instruction. It's about the science of instruction, which means, you know, what is your end goal for what the people need to learn or be able to do or whatever. So it, it kind of goes across both an educational learning context and an enterprise learning context. So there, and there's a mixture of that. The, the late Bob Mager used to joke at conference, he said, uh, we're still arguing about what's the difference between training and education. You already know. Stop this arguing. He said, imagine your kid goes off. This was the mid 80s. Imagine your kid goes off to college and they write home that they're taking a sex education course. Or they write home and say they've taken a sex training course. Well, the <laughs> audience just erupted. And he said, see, you already know the difference. So... <laughs> And so what that comes down to is in education, the the people, the professors, the instructors, they don't know what your terminal application is of what they're teaching you. They can only guess and assume and et cetera. They don't know exactly what your job tasks are going to be and what output you're trying to produce, but they're going to teach you some content, some give you some knowledge, give you some skills, but they don't know exactly how you're going to use it. But in an enterprise learning context, in a training context, we should be able to figure that out most of the time, not all of the time. So, so there's that difference. But, but so, in, so one of the other things that was going on is I had this job title and I met these people at this chapter and some of them had the ID title or the ISD title. But the funny thing is, is that some of the times that D stood for developer or development, instructional development, instructional developer, or instructional systems developer, or instructional systems development. And, and were those it, people were those people more in a kind of a builder role? Or no, they they were, there was no difference between what they did, because I would witness them talking about this. Well, what do you do? Well, that's what I do. How come my title is that? <laughs> and somebody else would pop in. I'm kind of making this up here in terms of how I saw how this unfolded in front of me. But other people said, well, I'm an ID, but it stands for designer, not developer. And and so in my take, and this is not universally uh, conceded to by anybody, instructional design is about creating or instructional development is about creating a thing, a learning experience is what we might call it today, or a performance support piece where, you know, you don't have to memorize anything. You just follow the guidance it gives you and you go do your job. Um, so there's that whole issue of instructional stuff or instructional systems. So the way I saw any difference in it is that instructional systems developer or instructional systems designer they were looking at the broad whole system of instruction, all the instruction you'll need to master your job, not this one course on how to use spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. an ID would do that, but the whole learning path, 
which I call training and development paths, going back into the early 80s, um, was all about creating the whole system of instruction. It's the whole set of curricula. It's the whole thing on how to get your yeah. degree by taking course after course after course with some electives. It was it was quite informed back then by systems thinking, wasn't it? It, it, uh, it was. It was a, a more holistic approach to what's the total hmm. job? What's the total set of instruction? Do you use spreadsheets here, there, and this other place too, or in just one place? And if you're in an enterprise learning context versus an education one. We'll teach you how to use that spreadsheet here and there and there because those are you, different applications. You know, you know, I just was reading this piece in in preparation. Oh, I wish I could remember the name of the author. He's from the University of Alabama. But he did a, a, a little potted history of, you know, this kind of movement from instructional technology to instructional systems development design. And then like, and then he kind of said, where it's ended up, at least when he wrote it, was instructional technology and design. But he said that the ACT, you know, who which um, like every five or ten years would come up with like a working definition. Mm -hmm. um, they changed the name of kind of what they were focused on to they took the word systems out. And the, the reason he said is because it was it. I forget how he put it, but like offended the constructivists. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. There's that whole debate uh, uh, about constructivism and, and, you know, where is it appropriate and all of that. And that's a huge issue as well as to, you know, do you start off novice performers with that? And the, the people that I follow would say, no, you do direct instruction to that. Once people have climbed the learning or performance curves and are high enough up that curve, then yeah, they don't need that direct instruction as much because they take new things and figure it out and blend it into whatever it is their their focus is. But but the whole so the instructional technology thing. So this was very confusing to me because I got a radio TV film degree. You know, that's what I was trained and educated to do. And I'm mentoring it's like, a, it's like Richard, Richard, Richard Clark. Richard Clark was, uh, I think, from a. Yeah, he a, was. He had the same kind of a background. <laughs> and uh, but uh, yeah, so he's one of those who's in that whole debate about constructivism and all that stuff with yeah. uh, with a whole bunch of other folks. Uh, but um, um, and he's a he's a he's a good person and a good mentor and a, and a friend of mine. But but uh, but the but the university programs of which there were only a couple. And the one that comes to mind right now is at Indiana University. They had an instructional technology program. And that was always confusing to me as to why they called it instructional technology or instructional design or instructional development. You know, why all this inconsistent language? It was it made it difficult for me to climb that learning curve to figure out, is that the same or different? And what's the difference? Is it nuanced or is it major? I, you know, it took a while to figure. And my conclusion out of all of that is that it's all arbitrary stuff. And you made this comment here about <laughs> semantics. I yeah. learned something in the mid nineties from one of my colleagues, one of my employees that he, his freight and he attributed it to somebody and I don't know who that was. So it's, it's, it's unattributed, but it's, it's not just semantics. It's always semantics. And, <laughs> and, and that made so much sense to me when he said that. I love that. And I you quoted uh, often enough um, because that's one of the things that people climbing the learning curve, getting into the field, have got to figure out that we are, our language, our labels that we use are quite arbitrary and the definitions for them are quite arbitrary and there's no consistency. So if you're looking for that, stop. Yeah, just, no, to get try it's to figure out point. what it is in yeah. the context, you know, what does this mean in but, this context? Yeah, but it's a good point. You know, you look at something like UX and you know, and and it's like, well, is this really about experience? Isn't it also about behavior? And and but like b because it's uh the profession seems to do fine and like nobody cares. Like nobody really cares. I mean, some people care, but like, but but really we understand what a like a you know a, a ux professional is and you know and um roughly enough that people seem to be able to have jobs and function right and and it's fine like you know it's more a uh, i don't know how to put it, like it's more denotative than it's more about the denotation than the connotation you know we can you can never um 
ultimately get a handle on connotations because they're going to change anyway. So, yeah, I mean, even if it's yeah. even if it was consistent at one point, it's going to evolve to something else because we have so much churn. It's one of the issues why you go to the conferences and you you see the same thing over and over again. And I heard the complaints of the old guard, as I called them, when I was uh, on the board and then became the president of NSPI, which was at that point then had become ISPI. Um, and But we had so many new people coming in that were brand new to the field and, and two thirds or more of the, of the people coming to conferences were new. So they had to hear the same the same old entry level kinds of stuff over and over mm. and over and over again. And, and people eventually go, you know, you're at your conference for your fifth or 10th or 15th year. And you're going, there's nothing new here for me. And that was true. And that was the complaint then. And I know that they complained about it at ASTD back then, which was a, which is ATD now. And, and ISPI people complained about it when it was NSPI back in the 80s. And so this is that issue we have. We have such a churn in our profession, the people coming and going. And and when they come in, they want to learn, you know, master their craft. And and so they come and they hear this and then they struggle with all the languages because one consultant has put their brand spin on their stuff. Yeah. It's the same as the next three presenters. It's It's marginally different. But not enough. I mean, it could have been called the same thing, but they all put their spin on it. And that was explained to me by Gary Rumler back in the late 80s or early 90s that that he was guilty of it because he was in competition with these people, the Joe Harlesses and the Bob Magers and all that. They, they all responded to the same RFP, RFQs, and 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 they were always but they. But if one guy, he as he put it, if one guy won the bid, he'd bring in all the rest of them and they'd all do the work because it was more work than any one small group could handle. And so they were, all their stuff was pretty much compatible. They just, it was nuanced in the difference in the language and labels and how they configured it. Yours is a five-step program, mine is six and a half, you know, and, but it's really the same thing. It's just carved up differently. It's like, you know, how many chunks can an elephant be, you know, that can be the front, the middle and the back or the top and the middle and the bottom. And the middle is the same. Is that the same? Well, kind of, but not. <laughs> um, and so, but, but we've always had these kinds of challenges. And I think that that's, that's, you know, uh, just the nature of the beast for the people coming in to learn that stuff. Um, you know, and so that, now we're into the learning experience and I've seen the debates about whether, you know, a learning experience designer is any different from an, an, an instructional designer or an instructional systems designer. And there's so many different spins on what learning experience design is. Is it holistic? Is it from end to end? You come in, you're new to the job, and they take you from being a, an entry-level employee, and you master things to a certain level, and then you go into the intermediate, and then you go into the advanced. Is that the whole thing, the whole enchilada, or not? And, and, but people differ. It's, it depends on how they're using it in their context and in their networks, how other people are using that. And I think that that's just another thing to be wary of, you know, learning and, and people want to be learning experience designer. My challenge with them is that do you do job aids, performance support? Because people can use those things and not memorize anything and they can forget about it till they have to use it. If it's for the annual inventory, nobody memorizes how to do the annual inventory. They follow the guidance that they're given. But a learning experience designer could have created that, but it ain't a learning experience. It's a performance experience. And so this is it goes back to that thing, Bob Mager, about is it education or training, you know? And our yeah, I mean, which hinders um, our development, I think, and it hinders our communication with our in, internal stakeholders and the new people coming in the door. Yeah, I mean, and I would argue that the word experience is also misleading insofar as we know from research that many students don't actually experience many parts of their learning. In fact, the, and, and in fact, what they do experience may be very misleading. Uh, you know, at least in terms of the, sub, the meaning of experience as, sub, you know, a subjective, um, whatever, mm -hmm. epi epiphenomena, you know, um, that that's not 
you know, that's not like a good word to use, you know, um, to, to, um, to kind of frame what's going on. I think, I mean, I think that probably, I'm not sure, but I mean, I think that people like Donald Clark mean it another way. They mean it in terms of like the way user experience is meant, which is like just to mean everything, you know, that you're like trying to do the whole package. But, but then one might counter that that's what it already meant, you know, that like, you know, people were already, you know, it goes back to the systems thing, like you were talking about. Yeah. It's like people just trying to take a, a comprehensive view. Okay, sorry. And then maybe you would then counter that, like, it it's just trying to be explicit about the connection to UX. And I think, I think that people should know UX, like we, we work with digital media, we work with you know, we want things to be usable and, and those are, it's a good area of expertise for people to have. Yeah. I, but, so I was challenged. I, I put something in LinkedIn the other day about a week ago or two weeks ago. And uh, that, you know, th I was a learning experience designer and somebody challenged me on that. And so I had to go back into, I have a, one PDF that's uh, 1400 pages long of all the quarterly newsletters. My, consulting firm used to do back in the 80s and in the 90s and up through 2007 when I switched over to a blog. And I had used the phrase learning experience in 1988 in the spring newsletter that we had in 1988. Yeah. It was about, it was, and so I used to talk and I knew that I had done that. And that's why I went looking there. Did I write it down? I didn't it, <laughs> it was, it was, but it was a designed learning experience. And I called the people going to that, not learners, but I called them participants because they were going to participate in a design learning experience to learn how to perform. And, but again, it was just, you know, me carving out, you know, how I would communicate and brand my stuff as a consultant, because I've been a consultant since 1982. And so you had to call your thing something. And if it was different from somebody else's, you didn't want to call it the same thing as somebody else's because yours had that whatever yeah. nuance, whatever spin, whatever thing, you know, you thought made it somewhat unique. And, and that, again, that just, it just makes it harder for the new people coming in to, to talk about that. But, but so is learning experience different, you know, is, is being concerned with the learner. And this is what the whole thing about, you know, I blame, Senge, Peter Senge, in his 1990 book, The Fifth Discipline, which talked about the learning organization, all of my clients, I work with Fortune 20, 30, 40, 50 clients, the, for, the top of the Fortune 500, and all of my clients, every last one of them from 1990 through about 95, 96, changed their names from training and development or something like that to learning and development. And I could tell many of them hadn't read the book, but all their executives were reading the book. This was <laughs> one of those things where my clients, one of my clients at AT and T, gave me a copy of that book and said, "You need to read this because all of my my executives are reading this." So this is the new, you know, look at it. And it was all about systems thinking and such, but talking about the learning organization, and a lot of training organizations thought that they were the learning organization. They completely missed the boat, and. And so the whole goal of a learning organization was to help an organization perform better by using systems thinking and, and et cetera, and, and, and shared learning experiences, blah, blah, blah. And, and so the, the whole field of training and development switched over. Their names didn't change much. And so some people would say, well, training, that's for dogs. You know, well, I, I, my retort to that was tell that to the U.S. Marines. Because they go through training. And because they've got to really master something for critical situations, high stakes performance. And so were we back in the days of training and development concerned with the learner? Well, you bet, because they're performers and they've got a job to do and we're trying to get them to be able to do it. But we're focused not on just the learning and what they like and what they want. It's what the job needs. They want to master their jobs. And if they weren't concerned with mastering their jobs, I think Bob Mager would have said, you need to go back to the recruiting and selection system and fix that because you got the wrong people here because they don't really care to learn the job. So we were always concerned about the person and what their incoming knowledge and skills would be and how to help them avoid training that they didn't need because they already knew it, 
or because they had the same job title as other people, but their job assignment was different. And so there were things that they didn't need. We would approach things with a modular curriculum so that they and their boss could say, well, you, you know, here's part of the training for your job title, but you don't do that. I have somebody else in the department do that. You don't do that. Your job is to do these things here, some subset of the whole. And here, and if we did the training thing right, we'd modularize our offerings so that people could get what they needed when they needed it and skip the things that they didn't need at all because it wasn't part of their job assignment or they already knew it. To me, that's personalized learning or personalized training that helps the person master their job to be successful at performing tasks to produce outputs that meet stakeholder requirements because it doesn't matter whether I'm happy with what I've learned if I can't really perform on the job and the various stakeholders, the customers downstream, the regulators, my bosses, my peers. You know, if I create unsafe working conditions for other people, that's no good, but I can still produce an output that the customer likes and the regulators like. But if if it's no good for my, so there's a lot of stakeholders involved in performance. And we're trying to understand all of that and what needs do we really need to attend to in all of that. And we argue about our language and labels. And my message would be to most people coming in, know that it's inconsistent and there ain't a whole bunch you can do about it because people have been complaining about this for 60 years. So that's not going to change anytime soon. There's no one authority body that can force everybody to some normalize yeah. definitions and terms it's just yeah, we all have wanted it and wished for it and prayed for it and even tried to work on it my professional society ispi i've been involved in at least three efforts to create a glossary of terms <laughs> and they get <laughs> lost and then you go do and you know seven oh, eight man. years later you do it again and then seven eight years later you do it again and you know it's it's for naught um, you know, you, you're better off spending your time trying to figure out in each situation that you find yourself in, what's the context? What do people mean by what they're talking about? And that in, requires us to do a lot of active listening, uh, um, using what Neil Rackham, who wrote the spin selling book, the famous spin selling book, you know, using the the behaviors, the communications behaviors, I call them, of you know, seeking information, giving information, testing, understanding, and summarizing. And he uses different ones in his sales course and his negotiation courses that he created back in the late 70s. But but it's all about, you know, how we interact, how we intercommunicate. That's really important for us to understand because we're going to find that inconsistency and we've got we can't let it stop us or slow us down or make us crazy. We really have to take each each interaction as a separate thing and try to figure out what are you saying? Am I reading that correctly? Do I understand that correctly? And use certain kinds of communication techniques um, and behaviors so that we can come to something close enough. Will it ever be perfect communication? You know, communication means that, you know, what you sent me, I, I received correctly and I've got it hundred percent. Well, that's, you know, that I wrote an article back in 1990. There's no such thing as zero, zero defects in communications. There's just no such thing. And so there's always, you know, and, and most of the time it doesn't really mess us up too bad, but other times it does. And so, to me, it's always about the sender. It behooves the center to make the sender to make sure that the receiver got it sufficiently. It shouldn't be up to you. If I tell you something to go do something and you didn't understand me correctly, that shouldn't be on you. It should be on me. I sh if it was important enough for me to send you this communication. So the same thing with all of our language and our in our job titles and all those kinds of things, you got to figure out what does learning experience design mean in this context, in this company? And is it consistent throughout that company? Because I would bet it's not. Um, but but don't you worry that, you know, as people sort of come up with like a new term and a new term and a new term, that for the new people, you know, for people coming in, or maybe not so new people, but people who don't have a strong intellectual background in this stuff, you know, that the, my, like the thing that, that worries me mostly uh, well as two things i think first 
there's there's a kind of a risk of intellectual dishonesty and maybe because i trained as a library and i worry about stuff like that you know that good for you <laughs> you know that like people were people are sort of taking credit for ideas that already this kind of oh. already happened actually and i and i think i worry about people not knowing where to start you know where to like you know to start learning and and what are the kind of what to prioritize and um you know when they if they were to read um you know some of this like kind of learning design stuff they they might have a limited kind of view of of what um what they could really be doing and, and how they could be solving problems and um i think in a way maybe some of it is like uh symptomatic of a kind of constructivist view and 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 maybe more broadly it's symptomatic of like educational views in higher ed where you know there's a lot of slogans you know there's a lot of like oh you know active learning or you know like or whatever be a be a guide on the side not a sage on the stage and it's like well yeah. okay that's all fine but but that actually isn't uh, you know like an empirical <laughs> like you know uh like you know like a kind of a, a operationalizable statement you know the the like the insights of of uh, cognitive science and of education go a lot deeper than you know just saying something like oh active is bit better than passive and and it's probably worth even questioning like, whether just I, even I, well, this, this that, is very true i mean this is uh um, my my phrase for a lot of this is "woe Ina." What's old is new again, and we see things that have been known and perhaps not embraced fully enough that somebody can come along and and put a new name on it. So we're seeing a lot of things that are have been around for quite a long time, and they're being touted now as brand new, new and different, and that's not necessarily true. And when you don't understand the history of some of these things, because there's some rich history about what works under what conditions and under what conditions doesn't it work. And when you embrace something that's supposedly new, but really isn't, and you don't dig deep enough to learn about the history and some of the research um, formal research and less formal research that's been done about these things and things that have been written up under different labels, under different titles, um, you'll miss that. And But so my advice to, and I've, and I've put this on a couple of videos here last year or the year before about when you're new to an organization, you need to learn what your organization calls things and kind of get a handle on all of that. And then you need to go and investigate everything that was called before, back in the days, back 60 years ago or more, um, to determine. Because if you think that workflow learning is new, well, I have a 1970 newsletter from Tom Gilbert and Gary Rumler on guidance. And I was given it in 1979. And I was told, well, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to do training programs. We're going to do guidance. We're going to give people checklists and flow charts and things like that to guide yeah. the performance. Well, yeah, and if you but read, we're going to have to call it listen. job aids because that's yeah. what it's known as now. Yeah, yeah. But if you listen, if you listen to the current um, and, and one of the most popular of them um, in the UK, um, who's a great promoter of, of performance supports like he yelled at me at like a conference where he's like that's not what i'm talking about and i was like holy shit, shit like this guy just like raised his voice at me in like a 20 person you know presentation but um uh it was you'd have no idea that, that like from him uh, that like this this kind of discourse goes back like 40 years or you know oh, like, yeah i mean like, it's it's longer than that. In 63, Rumler and Breathauer and a bunch of other people, George Rodorn and George Geis, were, right. were promoting a performance orientation to instruction that was either what we would call a course or a resource or a job aid or a training program. This all goes way back. 
I mean, these were the people that were all got involved in programmed instruction. And I remember what Rumler told me is that programmed instruction it, about it, NSPI, the National Society for Programmed Instruction in 1962, as it was known, um, the people that were the thought leaders in that came to the conclusion that even if they created stellar instruction, it wasn't enough. And they started looking at all the mm -hmm. other variables of performance that needed to be attended to, needed to be adequate to the needs of the downstream outputs that were being produced. And they all, and they were doing this in parallel with the total quality management movement. They were evolving total quality management and what, beca what became known as performance consulting back in the 60s and 70s um, to make performance better process performance out you know the cool quality thing they're parallel tracks on these things and you know when i see that uh, another one of these terminology things is performance consulting the whole notion of performance consulting has too often become to mean less than what it used to and that that was my point is that performance consulting uh should be looking at all the variables much like a a business analyst, uh, a quality analyst would look at the whole and do systems thinking around, here's this performance. I'm not just thinking about my solution set that I represent learning and, and development. I should be looking at what is really needed to help my client. And if, and if knowledge and skills, addressing knowledge and skills isn't going to be adequate, then they need to not do that they need to do something else. They need to re-engineer their process right. or the software tools or whatever the situation might be. And then that might lead to a need for new knowledge and skills of the performers. But we don't take the lead. We are we should follow on what the real root causes are, and that may have implications for us. That's one of the things that was explained to me is that people get confused. This was back in the 80s. Somebody told me that we get confused because we're always involved in all these improvement efforts. And yet the real improvement was something else, which meant we changed the knowledge and skill requirements. And then we had to step in and help fill and, and address those things. And we got too confused that we're always part of the solution set. And that might not be necessary. And too yeah. often it's a training course when we could have given somebody a job aid and, and that was it. They didn't need to go off to some course back in the Yeah, day. it makes me think about how, you know, they say this about, about learning styles that like, you know, every 10 years or so they'll they'll finally beat it, you know, and like put the put like the stake into the heart of learning styles and then it'll die and then it'll just rise from the ashes like a phoenix or you know or perhaps like a zombie and and come back again and um and and, and it, but it'll be called something else you know maybe this time it's um universal design for learning maybe that's the new learning styles and and so forth and like and it'll just keep resuscitating itself yeah and so so like these sort of bad ideas never die but like maybe the maybe what like i'm getting from you is that is that like actually the same thing happens with good ideas where like good ideas die and then and then but then they become become resuscitated as something else you yeah. know but we're like too confused to like know that or, or we're just been... too new and we don't know any different you know we, <clears throat> we are the turnips that fell off the turnip truck and now it's 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 new to us and so we don't appreciate that it may have some long history um and, but the, so one of the questions is you know why don't these good ideas have get enough traction um to sustain themselves and even if they're called you know you have your branded version of it and i have my branded version of it why are these things died off and i think a lot of it has to do with we're always looking for the quick solution so when authoring tools came about anybody could be an author and this is one of the things that Richard E. Clark talks about, uh, Dick Clark talks about, is that um, because of the non-conscious nature of knowledge, most knowledge is automated. You put an, uh, a subject matter expert, an expert in something, and make them the teacher, the instructor, or the author of some e-learning program. Well, they've automated 70% of what a novice needs to know. 
they can give them 30%. So their content is guaranteed to be incomplete. And when we, when we, these authoring tools made things cheaper and faster, but not better. But cheaper and faster is really appealing to management trying to control costs. And they gave up effectiveness for efficiency. Now, how efficient is something that's ineffective? I don't know. But 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 so our our clients, you know, and, and I think the authoring tool thing also meant, well, you could just about address everything. You know, in the old days, you didn't address everything under the sun that somebody might need on the job. You didn't you didn't cover how to uh, change the toner in the copy machine. Now, I had one client in a, in a crop project I did uh, for a sales group say that they wanted that included in the curriculum. Well, come to find out they'd lost a $5 million sale back in the 1980s because wow. they couldn't create, they created the response to the RFQ, the request for a quote. They created the response and they were supposed to send in five copies and the toner had gone on the copy machine and this was after hours and they couldn't get their stuff down to the Federal Express box soon Hello. enough. So they were out of the bid, out of the bid they had no chance of getting this thing. And that, that sales executive That's remembered amazing. that he wanted that covered in the curriculum that he was doing, you know, but otherwise we don't, we didn't try to cover all the little uh, low impact, low stakes things. We tended to focus on just some of the things and not everything. And now the authoring tools and the ease of creating e-learning allowed us, unfortunately, to address almost everything under the sun. And we created a lot of throwaway content that we wouldn't maintain. We wouldn't administrate it. We wouldn't keep track of it. It, you know, and so it had its one-time use and then it sat in the L LMS forever. And eventually somebody might clear it out because they noticed that no one's taking this anymore. Oh yeah, and here's more, you know, I have I, I did a project with the Norfolk Naval Shipyard and on the skill of active listening, my client went and found 27 different two-hour modules on active listening that the United States oh. Navy had paid for. It was in their inventory of content. Now, my client at General Motors had done a, a project because of the maintenance costs on overlapping curricula across all of General Motors North America was killing them. Because And when they were doing this maintenance, the executives figured out, well, we've got all this redundant content. This is like having a different battery for every one of the 147 different vehicles that they produced and a different uh, cable to hook the battery to the, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you just multiply that and they weren't sharing content like they shared parts in the automobiles and trucks and buses that they built. They were, it, everything was unique. And too often we in training, because of the ease of doing that, and you give a subject matter expert or a master performer or whatever you call them, an authoring tool and expect them to crank out some courses, they do. And and so it was Peter Senge, I would blame that. <laughs> and all this proliferation of authoring tools and the misguided notion that you can just set anybody in front of those authoring tools and they can crank out some good content. That's not true. Um, and this has just made, we work on a lot of low hanging fruit, so to speak. Um, I mean, we, 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 as the joke goes from the quality movement, we are opportunity rich. <laughs> We've got so many opportunities we can shake a stick at and we can't uh, address them all. We've got so many opportunities to improve. And I think one of the things that people coming into the field need to do is they need to focus on really mastering how to impact performance, take a performance orientation to the training, instruction, learning that they create and, and try to work as best they can on uh, the high stakes performance. But if I were to channel my inner Deming, W. Edwards Deming, you know, management, leadership of the learning and development function, they're in control of the philosophies and the processes and the practices that they put in place or the lack thereof. They're responsible for the lack thereof as well. And they, have, they haven't they have taken that performance orientation and working on the high stakes stuff with things that really will impact performance and you measure performance. So too often we're measuring engagement as a proxy for results. And that's measuring activities rather than results. 
and we're expecting there's to be some correlation and there's there's not i can be very engaged in some learning thing but it doesn't it's not applicable in my job it must have been training for somebody else's job but it was highly engaging and i can give you that score but it's not going to have an impact back on the job for me um so our language is just one of our issues. And I don't know how you're going to use all this in, the, in, the, in this. No, it's really, it's super <laughs> helpful. And it really um, gives me a, a whole kind of other perspective on it. It reminds me of, um, I've been reading that book, uh, Tinkering, Tinkering Towards Utopia by Larry Cuban. I don't know if you know. I'm it. not familiar with that. It's a good, it's a good one. He wrote a book also called uh teaching machines which was a book about like technology in schools and um anyway it's a book about the history of like school reforms in america and one of the kind of things that he talks about is how there's these this constant kind of in kind of these waves these undulations of like reform movements that are typically um driven or led by people outside schools yeah you know so so they get like some business leaders or like some ceos to um to to lead the whole thing and there'll be like one teacher involved and um and so there's this kind of history and then and then often you know especially as like technology became more prominent there's this kind of um framing of teachers as resistant and incompetent you know and that like yeah. the, t the tech is going to like sort of be teacher proof you know it's going to like you know that the teachers are sort of the bad guys and um i think we have this maybe maybe part of the reason we're like we're this way is because we don't we we don't kind of we don't be we don't have believe in ourselves you know like we don't actually like think that anything that anyone ever like produces is valuable and um the i think the other thing the other like i i read this other book um uh about the one laptop per child project um it was brilliant uh i forget the name of it but the the woman who did it it was a kind of ethnographic study of of the one laptop per child project and at the very end of the book she talks about how this other kind of similar related pattern where um you know we have this sort of archetype now in in the world but maybe particularly in america of the the tech ceo who's like the kind of you know dream big guy you know who yeah. and and which has really been the this sort of type of person has really been driven by um venture capital funding you know who are looking to invest in something that's going to like make you know 20 times the investment and there's an acceptance that maybe there's there'll be this kind of huge rate of failure with startups but you know one of these guys who's got you know his eye or woman you know who's got their their eye on the stars is really going to do it this visionary and and in a way we've i think in higher ed at least and maybe in other sectors seen people who've really kind of aped this style you know where they're yeah. like I've got these crazy new ideas and, and off and, and, you know, if you really want to be like that, you need to kind of do, do what you've described, which is just like basically take a bunch of old ideas and then like repackage them. Cause in a way, maybe, maybe ultimately like there's not that many, maybe there's just like not that many ideas in education. There's not like that many ways you can do it. Like you see kind of, you see this in, like if you did like a keyword search for like innovative education or like the future of education, it like usually if you look up stuff about the future of education, it's all problem-based learning. Like that, it's like, yeah, like, I mean, it's like, I could, I could think of nothing less futuristic really than just doing problem-based learning, but that's what yeah. you get, you know? Yeah. Um, the, the, and yeah, I, I, I mean, the politics of because there's so much money involved. I mean, learning styles is is been advanced and continues and won't go away because it's being taught. Uh, my university, University of Kansas, I'll mention this. I 
for about three years, uh, I'd go on a kick for about three or four months. And every week I would point out their websites at three of their different schools, the School of Medicine, the School of Education, and I can't remember what the other one was. And they would, on their websites, would be promoting learning styles. And here's resources for you to figure out your learning style. And so, and I would just bring this up here because it's a, you know, the research is pretty much against it. And yet the schools of education and the school of medicine is promoting this. And, you know, so again, I do this, I go back and look at this every few months and then all of a sudden they're gone. And I don't know that I could take credit for it, but, but there are, because I would say, well, at Vanderbilt, they're, they're, they take, I have a different take on this here. So I'll compete. I'll put you universities mm. up against each other here. Cause why is Vanderbilt trashing that? And you guys are embracing it. You're yeah. embracing me as an alumni. Vanderbilt um, do really, they've always got great stuff to me. I, and there are schools that do that, but, but, you know, we've got to go to the root of where's this all starting and teachers and students are being told that they've got learning styles and learning style preferences that make a difference. Um, and you know, yeah, there's people with certain learning disabilities or whatever the right political correct term is for this nowadays that need to be attended to differently. But otherwise, you know, the, 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 the there are all these faults and, and myths, and there are people that are fighting these myths. Uh, Clark Quinn, Will Tallheimer, uh, Alex Salas. There's lots of people who are trying to help our profession avoid these myths and really focus on the things that are really critical. Jane Bozart at the Learning Guild uh, has published a lot of research papers on, on this and trying to help people because the people that are coming, again, the churn in the field, a lot of new people coming in with a lot of false notions who look at things and that, that seems reasonable that there's learning style. Of course, that makes a perfect sense. But, you know, leaning uphill when you're downhill skiing makes perfect sense, too, except it's it's not going to work. It's counterintuitive. Um, and so there are many, you know, turning into the skid in the snow when you're sliding your car. You know, it's it, there's things that are counterintuitive that are the right way, the, the truth. And and so there's too many too many of us who are new are are subject to these things and and learn about this. Uh, my first boss in 1979 gave me the Myers Briggs test uh, my first week in on the job, and then six weeks later she gave it to me again and she said, "See, it's different. This is baloney. You don't need to ever believe any of this stuff." And so I oh, got that's what you say. That's amazing. That's this, brilliant. And she said, and she said, you know, when you took the test initially, you were just under, you just graduated from college. You just moved across the country. You just started a new job. You were looking for a place to live. You had all these stress things going on in your life. And, you know, six weeks later, it all calmed down and you, you answered these things differently. And if we did this again in the six weeks or six months, you'd, you'd have a different profile. So, these are the things not to believe and don't believe in, uh, she, we didn't talk about learning styles, in, but there was these other myths that were prevalent. And luckily the people that I went to work for had been schooled by the, the Rumlers and the Gilberts and the Magers and the Harlesses and those people here in America who really uh, were looking at the science, the technology, if you will, of instruction and with a performance orientation. That was the thing that Tom Gilbert, who was a student of Skinner's, what Tom did was he applied Skinnerian thinking to the organization, the enterprise, or you know whatever you want to call the, the corporate world, and because it was different than in an educational realm. And, and so the things that there's a lot of things that overlap and are true in education versus training, despite what Bob Gilbert or uh, Bob Maker said about uh, sex education and sex training. But but there's, because we can take the education and put it in a context, in a process performance context and, and help people make that transition, make that transfer, uh, hopefully near transfer to what they've got to do back on the job. Um, and I think that that's really the important critical aspect that's different i mean there's a lot of a lot of noise a lot of things that are true 
But I think singularly focusing on what are the outputs that people are there to produce? What do they got to do? What are the behaviors, the, the behavioral tasks and the cognitive tasks? And then what do they got to know to be able to do those behavioral tasks and those cognitive tasks to produce that output? And and there's and I and I and and somebody who's not been schooled in educational theory and et cetera, but just guided as a practitioner from the very beginning, I've had a lot of success in helping my clients produce instruction and training and learning that really help people master their jobs. And that gave them great satisfaction. They reduced turnover. I did a project with Bank of America back in the late 90s, and they reduced turnover by 35% because I helped them convert. They had seven sets of curricula from all the bank mergers that they had, and they were maintaining those. And they said, we got to get this down to one. And I helped them do that and put the performance orientation on it. So it wasn't topic and topic and topic. It was really task set with an output and a task set because these are the things that you do and this is what you're trying to produce and if we could help people singularly focus on the performance and there's many people nowadays who are still talking about those kinds of things the carl binders the judy hales uh, steve villachica uh in in europe david james i think donald clark thinks about those kinds of things too bob mosher and, and conrad gottfordson um there are people who are promoting a performance orientation. We all talk about it a little differently. That's that language thing. We're all a little inconsistent one to the next about how we describe these things. But I think if people can look beyond that and find what the root is and make it their own, they'll be successful and they can be very successful. Um, and there's a lot of things that I think are true in enterprise learning and development that are true in educational learning and development. It's just that you can't go that last mile in education because you don't know what guy's job tasks and outputs are, but you can know that he needs to know active listening, that he needs to know how to use a uh, construct spreadsheets, that he you know he needs um, critical thinking skills in that domain that he works in. But so I think that there's a big huge opportunity for us all to work together and to help people do a better job and take the learning sciences as they're called nowadays and understand them and see them in the context in which we all work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I certainly think that for, for education, for higher education, there's, there's, there's so much, so much room for improvement. And I mean that in the most, kind of positive, exciting, excited way, you know, because um, if we were, if, if we'd, you know, I'd, I'd rather work in a field, you know, where there's like lots to kind of achieve than, you know, something where we were like, okay, yep. It's not rote. What I guess we've done it now. Yeah. <laughs> Time to move on. Yeah, um, no, we are, as we, as you know, as I joked earlier, we are opportunity rich. And there's a yes. lot of things yeah. coming and there's a lot of things we should not get uh, too enamored with and misunderstanding what it all means. You know, what about artificial intelligence and all that stuff? What are the uh, uses and what are the issues associated with that? I mean, it. I think it's, it, it affords us, it can be a great help, but there's going to be issues along the way, just like there has been with, I think, every every new um digital technology as well as you know every every new thing that's learned about the sciences of learning etc we can take advantage of those things but we there's going to be people who inadvertently or deliberately mislead us um in that and we have to be careful about that we have to be on guard ever vigilant indeed indeed but i i should uh i should run um my son's back as as you might have seen um but it, it's been amazing talking with you thank you so much um you. and i i think that once we get the recording of this i'm i'm probably going to try and watch it again and like take notes okay and, yeah i'll I'll send, I'll send you a and, copy of this and you can edit it and do whatever you please with it yeah no i'm i'm going to just I, I think i'll probably try to like record it and like outline it and um but it's it's really, I mean, it's, 
I, I probably it's not encouraging, <laughs> but you know, it's like it is enlightening. Um, and uh, that's great, you know. Well, Leonard, thank you for uh, inviting me, asking me to uh, talk with you about this. I hope it's been helpful, and I hope it. Yeah, it, 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 it's. It, I hope it becomes encouraging uh, and enlightening. I think there's. It's. We are all challenged uh, in our field for me, for many different reasons, but I think that there, you know, we are doing good work and can help people, and I think that's really what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, you know, and yeah, just amazing. I mean, you know, I love, I love what you're doing, Guy, and I'm really grateful that, uh, I'm really, as cheesy as it sounds, I'm really grateful that you're in my feeds, you know, and you're, you're raising the, raising the, the quality of discourse, you know, for, for all of us. Well, thank you, Leonard. You have a great day. Okay. All right. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.